Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So the Biden administration today allowed some allowed media in the uh, in the tent in the tents down on the Mexican border, uh, the Texas Mexico border. Uh, and look, I said they should have done this day one. Uh, so this is a good decision in my view. They should have done it day one to show just how bad things were uh, and how bad Trump had bungled things and what they were left with. Day one, this is what it should have been. And then maybe we would have been saved from whatever the heck that little mockumentary or or jungle tour that Ted Cruz took us on, uh, talking about infant babies. And you go, what is it about these these people? And Infant babies. Is that like the trigger word to get you to then care? If we would have said infant babies four years ago, would Ted Cruz have actually given a, you know what? And the answer is no. And here to share some thoughts on, well, the Ted Cruz. I've asked Rick Levy to come talk with us. Rick is the president of the Texas AFL-CIO. Rick, thanks for taking time for us. Oh, it's awesome. I love being on your show, Rick. Thanks for having us. So, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm sure you saw the uh, whatever that was at midnight on the Texas border, you know, going into the jungle, you know, yeah. braving the, the you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know how to describe it other than I think Beto O'Rourke described it pretty well, trying to cosplay uh, a, a border patrol agent or something. It was. I mean, my question is, how does the man do this without like just totally laughing and, and, and keeping a straight face? He has pushed the bounds of any conceivable self-respect, I think, with how he's acting. And for him, uh, OK, just to be really clear, I mean, we're talking about hypocrisy in Ted Cruz. So there's there's uh, it's fertile territory. Right. But for him, after what we've been through the last four years on the border with Donald Trump, um, to show this feign outrage now at how people are being treated when he didn't say a goddamn thing during four years of time and in fact defended the Trump administration's completely inhumane treatment of people coming here to seek a better life. Um, I just uh, I just have a I have an ama- I would love to be a fly on the wall when he talks to himself about what he's going to do because I just I would love to see how he makes it all work in his head. Well, I mean, he, I, I, not only is he despicable, he's soulless. And that's the problem. This is this is someone who it's all about the game of politics and it's not about solving problems. It's not, it's not about the game of politics. It's about the game of Ted Cruz self aggrandizement. I mean, it's, it, there's not even a consistent political thing other than his own positioning um, t- to, to meet his own pro- uh, delusions of grandeur. That's it's it's completely soulless. That's a great word. And it's um, just just watching him makes your stomach crawl. But, you know, I, I look at this and, and we talked about this yesterday a little bit. Uh, the fact that they're rewriting what the history has been. Uh, you had Donald Trump coming out and saying that, you know, all the people who you know invaded our capital, all the insurrectionists, all those those folks who, you know, who wanted to destroy our, our democracy, uh, that they were, you know, they're being persecuted, that uh, that they, they were friendly. They were hugging the police. They had great relationships with the police. Yeah, by stabbing them with the flag and beating them with a fire extinguisher. Great relationships. And you got this with, you know, with with uh, Ted Cruz. You know, it's all Joe Biden's fault. Like, never had this problem before. It's it's this revisionist history. It's this. They think we're st- they think we're stupid. And some of them, I guess, are. Well, I don't know if people are stupid as much as they just never hear anything different. And um, when you spend time in that bubble, um, that becomes your reality. That's why it's so difficult to penetrate and actually have a conversation with somebody who, if, if all you get is that information that it was Antifa that stormed the Capitol, then, uh, and you don't get any other source of information, what do you think? Look, I w- we went to the border. We did a border uh, solidarity delegation to El Paso. Um, and when people were being excluded and people were living... Um, literally in cardboard boxes lined up on the other side of the border um, when he completely shut down um, political refugees from even being able to enter the country to get asylum. And we talked to the folks and we talked to the workers and we saw the immense human suffering that was caused by this ideological racist approach to immigration that Donald Trump and Ted Cruz championed. And it was heartbreaking. Um, We saw Rick, we saw veterans of this country who had been deported um, uh, by this previous administration. And I didn't hear peep one out of Ted Cruz 
Um, and so um, I just, I just, I, I, I guess I, I would like to know, I mean, we, we kind of know what he is here in Texas. Do people where y'all are at, do they like think that he's serious? I mean, do people like, what, does it make sense to you? No, it doesn't make sense. But here's the thing. Ted Cruz wasn't alone. There were 18 no. senators that were down on that border who were acting like they were, they were Magellan discovering new territory. Right. Uh, that, oh, my God, this is such an atrocity. Oh, my gosh. You know, who knew? Well, you, this is right. not new. This is 40 years in the making. And you in Congress, all 18 of you are now pretending like, hey, we found something. You're right. the ones who fell down the, jo down the job because you're the ones who are the ones who are supposed to fix this. It's the right. fact that we don't have legislation. Well, we don't, don't have, have rules to do this right. They don't have any desire to fix it. They have a desire to campaign about it. And uh, I'm sick of it, really sick of it. Yeah, I, again, you, I, I love this revisionist history stuff, though. It's it's crazy. But here, but here's the other part of this. And you know, I have I have friends who everyone's got their opinion on what should happen on the border. I've got friends who think you swing the doors wide open, let let everybody come in. I've got people who say, no, no, we need giant eighteen hundred feet walls and 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 you know, bob wire and all. And then every thought in between. This is where Congress had better figure this out. Uh, or we're going to continue to have these crises over and over again, and it's going to be people who suffer on both sides of the border. Um, you know, you just laid that out, Rick, and it's it's really interesting. You know, for a long time, uh, people did not see immigration as an issue that labor needed to be involved in, um, and particularly in Texas. Uh, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, there were broad sectors of the labor movement that felt like our our um, our immigration policy ought to be, you know, call immigration when you see somebody um, working that you think might not have papers. And that has changed so dramatically. And it's just because of situations like where you just talked about. It is used as a wedge. It is used as a way to keep all workers down. It's used as a way to pit one set of workers against another set of workers. It's, it's used to create a sense of other when it should be a sense of us. And I think we've Certainly, we realize at the Texas FLCIO that until we can have a sane immigration reform that truly respects the humanity of each person, whether they're an immigrant, whether they're native born, and in many cases, it's both in families in Texas, until we can treat every worker with dignity and respect, all workers are going to suffer. No, and I, I, that's, that's, that, it is critical that we get some immigration reform passed. Because until we do, it's going to be a major wedge that's going to divide all of yeah, us. Yeah, and, and sadly, you know, the, the more we allow to have undocumented people in the shadows, uh, the easier they are, they are to be exploited, the easier they are to be taken advantage of, and pull conditions down for everyone else. Exactly. Uh, you got to bring people out of the shadows. There's got to be a pathway to citizenship. we got to figure this out. And look, not everybody's going to be happy when you come up with the rules. Everybody's going to be mad about something, but you yeah. have to have a way forward. Yeah, and I, I would just say one other thing about bringing people out of the shadows. Um, yes, it's important that we all don't, uh, that we all get pulled down when certain people don't have uh, rights. But, you know, when you talk to people uh, and you listen to their story and you listen to their experience, um, you can't deny their humanity. And I think part of what happens is we push things off to the side so we never have to really confront what we're doing. The, the children that go to school every day, not knowing if when they come home, their parents are going to be there. Uh, the parents who have literally trekked across continents to try and scrape out a better life for their kids. You don't hear that. You don't see that. And so you're not you're able to, like, not take that into account in terms of what you think should happen. No, I say um, it all the time. If I was on the southern end of the border and I'm looking across that line at a way to feed my kids, there's nothing stopping me. OK, so, Rick, when you say that, when when my middle son was 13 years old. We took a trip to the border. This was maybe 10, 15 years ago, 15 years ago. And um, we it's a group. There's a group uh, that goes down. We meet with um, factory workers on the other side of the border, people that work for these huge corporations like Phillips and General Motors and get paid uh, just nothing. Um, and, you know, we had dinner in some of the homes of the folks across the border. And it was, you know, they were made out of corrugated tin, um, no floors, no running water. And we sat and we talked to the workers and we said, you know, what, why, why, why do you stay here? You know, look across the board and they said, this is our home. This is, you know, this is where we live. This is our country. We want to make it work here. You know, it's sometimes we become desperate. And I, 
remember going back uh, with my son on the bus and I told him, I said, look, just what you said. I said, if, if it was ever the case that um, we found ourselves by the, you know, by the luck of the draw born on this side of the border in these conditions, I guarantee you that I would spend every single day doing everything I possibly could to get across so that I could provide a life for you that you, that I believe you deserve as a human being. And when you see people in our country that have made that same journey, you understand what it is that they have gone through to be where they are. And, and, and when you look in somebody's eyes, that's what you see. You don't see other, you see uh, a, a fellow human being who's desperately trying to provide something for their family. Yeah. And at the end of this, you know, where I, where I come back to, you know, as a working person, as a, as a trade unionist, um, the wealth class has always been able to use that division to, to keep us pitted against one another so that we yeah. don't go after them clearly. Yeah. And you look at the fact that we haven't had major labor law reform in this country uh, that has benefited work workers in you know 70 plus years. Uh, we haven't had things uh, that help us organize. All, all, all it is about is helping corporations and helping the very wealthy. And we're in this weird little moment. You know, I look at someone like Ted Cruz, who's down there now talking about infant babies and uh, breastfeeding mothers and oh, how he now cares. And I'm going, you know, what have you done to help them? What have you done to help any working person? Well, I mean, in all fairness to Ted, I mean, Rick, I know you're a journalist. You have, you know, you, you pay attention to the truth. He has voted with, with, with workers 6% of the time in his career. So, I mean, um, you know, I don't think we can discount that 6% um, in terms of his commitment to working class people. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, when I see him trying to say that, you know, he's the party of working class people now from his porch in Cancun during the during the storm, um, um, uh, it's, I'll tell you how you become a friend to working people, Ted. You vote for the PRO Act. You give people the right to organize. Um, you, uh, you restore the balance between workers and corporations in this country. That's, how, that's what you do. And if you're not willing to do that, then don't even come talk to us about how you're representing working people. No, look, you're, you're, at, least, at least Donald Trump sh showed up in, in Puerto Rico to throw some paper towels out. Uh, Ted ran away. I mean, this is this is the yeah. weird thing. I mean, yeah. uh, and and this is where you know, since you brought up, you know, um, you know, down in Texas during the storm, how are you doing? I know the last time yeah. we talked, you know, things were a yeah. little dicey. How are yeah. things recovering? Things are recovering, although you know the the now we're seeing the real economic fallout. There's still people who don't have water, which is amazing, but we see the scrambling now to cover up for the utilities that. Um, that actually made a fair degree of money during this whole process, shockingly. Um, and we learned that, you know, this whole system now in Texas, our, our utility system is was designed by Enron. So that ought to tell you something. Um, literally, the deregulation that we live under was 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 born and paid for uh, by Enron back in the back in the uh, early part of this century. Right. So um, it's no surprise that that um, when things fall apart things go pretty well for the folks at the top, but, you know, we're having skyrocketing electricity bills. We're having people having to pay for repairs of frozen plumbing, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's still a lot of economic dislocation and, uh, you know, we're still trying to make sure that everybody that we can help, uh, gets power and gets, uh, gets water back on in their yeah. houses. Our thoughts, our, our thoughts and hope go, goes out to Thank them. You. you know, as my friend, Greg Palace, you know, s said, you guys got Ken laid. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it was what it was. It was what it was. I mean, I was there. I was in the Capitol. I saw it. And uh, Ken Lay and that whole crew, they were treated like conquering heroes, man. They had this great new idea. We were going to deregulate everything so they could make all the money in the world. And uh, yeah, now we're paying for it 20 years later. No, I mean, this is this is what it is. The wealthy get wealthier and the rest of us, well, uh, not so much, which is why what I'm looking at going on down in, in Bessemer, Alabama is so important. Uh, the fact that those workers to this point have you know have you know been courageous and have you know cast their ballots. I'm waiting for the vote returns. Yeah. Uh, I'm hoping for something positive. Uh, yeah. But this again is another reason why we need the PRO Act because I think you know what we saw and I think this was a very public display is all of the things that corporate America has been getting away with for decades. Only now it's been magnified because you know it's the a giant behemoth Amazon. Yeah. Shocked, shocked that workers get fired for trying to organize unions. I mean, it happens every day. And if anything points out the need for the PRO Act, um, this organizing campaign and what those workers are going through 
points it out. But I will say one other thing about that. And I'm, th I'm saying that regardless of the outcome of this election, this organizing campaign has rocked the world. And let me tell you, there are millions of, or maybe not millions, thousands of Amazon workers around this country that never even knew they had the option to organize a union. There's thousands of, hundreds of thousands of people who work in warehouses around this country that had no idea that a union was something they could do. And now you hear the president talking about it. So yes, I'll say this, I'll say yes, uh, we need to pass the PRO Act and this is an amazing opportunity to do it. But unions need to also understand, and the thing that's exciting about Amazon is that unions now do understand that if we're gonna, organ if we're gonna win in this country, we have to organize the South because what happens in the South doesn't stay with the South anymore. Um, we export, our biggest export is crazy right-wing politicians. <laughs> and until we can figure out a way to change the South, we're still gonna be dealing with the Ted Cruz's of the world. Look, the difference between Texas and California, it's not who lives there, it's the size and strength of the labor movement. And, and so our responsibility is to build the labor movement in places like Texas and Alabama and Louisiana and Florida and Mississippi and Virginia and Carolina. Because when we do that and we give workers a voice, not only do they have a voice in their job, they have a voice in their communities and we can change the politics of this country. And when we change the politics of this country, we change the world. And we have the ability to do that in the South if we can all come together and really figure out the way to organize uh, for workers in the South. No, you're, you're spot on. And as I always say, what the boss fears most is an empowered employee, uh, yeah, someone who no, feels they have the right to have their voice heard and the yeah. right to share in the profits that their labor creates. That that The wealth class wants none of that. You know, there's a really funny thing. I'll say that I don't know how much time we got, but there's there's you know we're in the middle of our legislative session now. And uh, this right-wing Republican um, filed this bill. And I think it was after, he filed it after the insurrection. And it was a bill that made it illegal to fire an employee because they, they uh, did something off the job yeah. um, that the employer disagreed with, right? So it's basically guaranteeing First Amendment rights in the workplace for workers for conduct that takes place out of the workplace. And so I'm saying, hmm, you know what really would do that? Unions. <laughs> you know, and so uh, when this bill comes up for hearing, he's going to be shocked when we all show up testifying for his bill about how great, uh, how great it is for workers. That, no, there you go. I'm with you on that. Would not, democracy would not stop at the plant gate. There you go. Uh, they want to protect people who are involved in treason. You just want to pr protect people who, who go to work and, and do a good job. Rick, yeah. I appreciate the time. Great talk with great. you. I hope you'll come back and talk to us again. It's, it's really fun. Thanks for doing the work. Thanks for raising your voice so consistently. And anytime y'all want to talk, we're ready. Beautiful stuff. Thanks so much, Rick Levy, president of the Texas AFL-CIO. Quick break. Right back. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. Remembering that united we bargain, divided we beg. Rick Smith.